I want to welcome all of you to the 2017 Walker and Dunlop Summer Conference on behalf of everyone at Walker and Dunlop. As I thought about what I could potentially share with you all this morning, there is nothing that I think is more impactful and powerful to what's happened in my life than the experience that I've gone through. I'm an image person. I'm the son of a professional photographer and a father who has always focused on where someone went to school or the companies that they work for. And so I've always had images and what images look like in my mind. If you think that this display behind me or the way that the layout or the invitation to Sun Valley was approved on the first proposal, uh, you're, you don't know me very well. Uh, and Susan Weber would love to work for you. Uh, <laughs> the image I want to paint for you is in December of 2010 as Walker and Dunlop has just gone public on the New York Stock Exchange. And after ringing the opening bell, my wife and my boys and I posed for a picture. And there we all are with smiles and thumbs up. And that picture became our Christmas card that year. And what you would see in that image is a family that's just taken the family company public, smiling kids, healthy kids, and everything looks really great in the Walker household. And as we all know, you can't judge a book by its cover. And what Sheila and I were going through on a personal basis at that time was I don't think terribly dissimilar to what goes on in most young couples' lives as it relates to the challenges of raising young kids, building a career, money, friendships, time management, all the things that most people deal with in raising a family and trying to create a life. And so we would have disagreements, and it was as if we were playing a ping pong match. I would have my issue and sort of hit the ball across the table. She'd have her issue. She'd hit it back at me. And this went on for quite some time. The difference in Sheila's and my relationship than many others is that as that ping pong match went on, something would trigger me to get very upset. And um, our arguments would turn into a fight. And during those fights, I would view them as the ability for me to just release. Issues that had built up, I'd just say, ah, we'd have this fight, and the next morning I'd wake up, and I'd feel fine. I got it off my chest, all good, let's move forward. But that wasn't what Sheila was experiencing. She was scared by the intensity of my words. She was deeply hurt by the demeaning and derogatory comments that I would say during those fights. And that interaction undermined the core trust of our marriage. And so as the ping pong match went on and as the fights would happen, uh, in October of 2015, we were at a counseling session and our therapist turned to Sheila and said, what would you like to do? And she said, I want to get separated. Now, I'm a, I'm a problem solver. Most of you in the room who run companies or do deals, you don't get the easy stuff that comes to you. You get the hard stuff. Your job is to fix problems. And so all of a sudden, I was faced with the biggest problem I'd ever had in my life. And so my natural reaction, my natural tendency, was to fix it. And so for the next three months, the ping pong match basically turned into a one-way ping pong match. She'd serve an issue, and I'd just take it. And I didn't return service. And my expectation was that if I let all those things happen and I just completely capitulated, that everything would get better. And unfortunately, it didn't. And so my expectation was that it was going to get better. It didn't get better, and all that did was make my anger deeper. And so over Christmas vacation of 2015, we finally said, this is done. We're split. And we went back to Washington in January. And what I would call the mourning process began for me. The mourning of losing my life partner and Sheila. The mourning process of losing my nuclear family. The fear of telling my colleagues and my friends that my relationship had failed. 
And that was a very, very low time for me. And I will never forget one night, sleepless night, and I woke up in the morning, and Sheila walked into the guest room in our house, and she handed me a book. And she said, you might want to read this. And the book was called Taking Charge of Anger. It's written by a gentleman named Dr. Robert Ney. Sheila had given me that book a number of years before. But when she gave it to me a couple of years before, I had every reason in my mind to justify why I could act the way I was acting. I was a type A hard charger. I was a competitive athlete. I was running a publicly traded company. I had the right to be aggressive. I had the right to act the way I did. That, was, that edge was what made me what I was, how wrong I was. So I opened up Taking Charge of Anger. And in the beginning of the book, there's a number of questions to try and sort of calculate your anger, and whether you're vindictive, whether you're passive aggressive, whether how you deal with anger. And one of the questions was if you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off, your reaction is mumble something to yourself, curse the person out, and just keep on going, pull up next to the person and flip them the bird. Pull up next to the person, flip them the bird, roll down the window and give them a piece of your mind. Or pull up next to them and cut them back off and be vindictive. And I'm sitting there going, is there an all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that this book had something in it for me. And so I devoured that book. I read it from cover to cover as quickly as I possibly could. And I also started to work with Dr. Ney, just happens to be that he lives in the Washington area. And Sheila coordinated for me to go find Dr. Ney and to meet with Dr. Ney. And over the ensuing year, 2016, I started to think about the way that I was living my life, the way I was acting. And the book helped me understand that most anger comes from missed expectations. And as you dive into this type of work, you realize that there are two sides to expectation and anger management. The first side is your own personal narrative. What's the world that I'm interacting with supposed to be like? And how do I process what I'm seeing and what I'm doing? And the other side is physiological. So on the processing side of things, let me give you an anecdote. <coughs> I'm TSA pre, as I'm assuming most of the people in this room are. And I started using TSA pre, and I arrived at the airport, and over a period of time, my expectation was that TSA pre pretty much took me three to five minutes to get through security. And so I started to plan that I could leave my house at 6 a.m., drive 20 minutes, get through security in five minutes, walk to the gate in five minutes, be at my gate half an hour before my seven o'clock flight. So I lived my life that way, that was my expectation. Then all of a sudden, one day I show up, and the TSA pre-line is out the door. And now I'm pissed. I'm like, who did they let in the TSA program? <laughs> and oh, by the way, what's up with the staffing model that TSA has that they've got these people who can't process enough people? And I'm sitting there, I'm getting more and more pissed off. I'm watching my watch, and the flight's getting closer and closer to leaving. My stress level is up. I'm making chippy remarks about the people in line next to me. I get to the guy to check my thing, and I'm telling him that his boss's staffing model is all screwed up. And then I get through the security thing, and I race to my gate. And when I get there, I'm flustered, and I'm pissed off. And I finally either make it or don't make it. But I'm just in a bad place. And it's all because my expectation was it was three to five minutes, and it turned into 15 to 20 minutes. But the issue with that is the only reason that I needed five minutes to work is because I made the decision to leave home at 6 a.m. Me. And so now, if you see me show up in a TSA pre-line, and it's 15 minutes long, I sit there and I go, you're the dumbass who left home at 6 a.m. <laughs> and if you miss your flight, you miss your flight, and you'll get on another one. But I don't have those chippy comments. I don't make the comment to the TSA guy, and I just hang out. That's the narrative. Now let me go to the physiological. 
Last summer I was here in Sun Valley and I was biking up the bike path. I'm with a buddy on my right, I'm on the left, we're heading north, and a person biking south is down on his bike and he's looking at his computer and he's not noticing that he's drifting into my lane. Each one of us has inside of us a fight or flight mechanism that must fire at that moment. You're either going to fight it or you're going to run away from it. It's physiological. We're all built with it. What, when you do this work, what you get to know, though, is you can feel it coming on and you can learn how to control it. So my buddy's to my right. I'm down on my bike and I'm watching this guy. And he's drifting at me, drifting at me. And I'm saying to myself, I'm in control. I will either wait for him to keep coming at me and I'll swerve around him or he's going to look up in about two seconds and he's going to swerve back the other way. But I'm in control. All of a sudden, the guy's about 10 feet in front of us and my buddy screams at the top of his lungs, Hey, asshole, look up! <laughs> and this guy looks up startled and he turns quickly and he misses the two of us. Keep on going and my buddy looks at me and he goes, Do you have a death wish? <laughs> and I go, I don't have a death wish. He's like, why didn't you say anything? And oh, by the way, when the guy passes us, my buddy turns around and goes, get your head out of your ass. You can't bite through that way. What are you doing? And I look at my buddy and I'm like, well, I was in control. I was going to make a reaction to what he was doing. My buddy sits there and he just shakes his head. I said, I, I can't believe you didn't, you didn't raise your voice. Most of my friends in this room who biked with me before know that probably a year before that, I would have stopped. I would have turned around. I would have caught the guy <laughs> to show him that I was as fast a biker as he was or faster. And then I would have given him a piece of my mind as it relates to what bike etiquette ought to be like on the job. <laughs> it's true. It's sad, but it's true. So I'm doing this work, but Sheila's still out of the relationship, and we're still headed to get separated. So in February of last year, we told the boys, hardest conversation either of us has ever had. And then, sorry, um, in April of last year, I bought a new house. And all the while, the work keeps going. And I want to give a quick anecdote on kids. Because I prided myself on being sort of the uber dad. And I think in hindsight, I was sort of an A for effort. I was always there doing things. But from a connectivity standpoint with my boys, I probably got a D or a C. Because I was living with my boys and managing my boys to my expectations and not to who they were. And my desires for them and not who they truly were. So our middle son, Charlie, has a tough time keeping everything in his world kind of in form. And so in the morning when we wake up to go to school, our son Jack ready to go at the back door, our youngest son Wyatt ready to go at the back door, but invariably as the train was heading out the door, Charlie would say, oh, I forgot my textbook upstairs, I forgot my tie, I forgot my sneakers for gym class. And the whole Walker family train out the door would come to a grinding halt, Charlie would go running off. And I thought that if I just incrementally raised my voice every day a little bit higher, that at some point, Charlie would just all of a sudden figure it out and show up at the front back door ready to go to school the next day. And so the stress and the anger and the yelling just kind of got higher and higher and higher. And as I was doing this work, I tried to focus in on what the pressure points were. And what I realized was that I really didn't care whether Charlie got to fifth grade math class at 8 AM or at 8.05. What I really was focused on was being at Walker and Dunlop at 8.30 because I wasn't going to be late for our 8.30 meeting. So what I said to my assistant, Carol, was no meetings before 8.30 in the morning. 9 a.m. is when I start at the office. If I'm out for breakfast, if I'm on the road, don't worry about it. But when I'm home and taking the kids to school, nothing starts at Walker and Dunlop until 9 a.m. And by moving that first meeting from 8.30 to 9 a.m., the stress and pressure on my side to get Charlie and the kids out the door removed itself. So now all of a sudden, Charlie shows up the next day, and he forgets his tie upstairs, and I'm just hanging out watching. And then the next day, I say, huh, instead of Charlie going and trying to fish his thing up on his own, why don't I go help him? So I grab his hand, and we're walking up the steps. He literally, halfway up the steps, took my hand and let go of it. I think having this out-of-body experience of like, hold on a second, 
The guy who used to sit at the back door screaming at me is now helping me go find my tie. And four to six weeks later, four to six weeks later, Charlie still forgets stuff. Charlie's a forgetful kid. I gave him a t-shirt in the airport the other day and he forgot it in the airport. <laughs> but all the stress and problems of getting out the door went away and 90% of the time, Charlie's got his stuff together. And the emotion of that moment is gone. At work, we had a group inside of Walker and Dunlop that had been struggling for a number of quarters, eight or nine quarters. And I thought the only way to get that group to perform was for me to put them right in my fist and to hold them, to put them in the corner and every single time we'd get results, kind of beat them up. Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? You missed expectations, you missed expectations, you missed expectations. You should drive me nuts and I know for a fact the manager of that group drove them nuts too. And during this work I realized that expectations are going to be missed unless you give people time and reasonable expectations to meet. So rather than managing this on a weekly basis and a monthly basis, I just said, I'm going to let go. Here's what I expect by the end of the year. Have at it. If you make it by the end of the year, great. If you don't make it by the end of the year, we got another discussion to have. That was a very difficult thing for me to do. And it was even more difficult because we are a publicly traded company that relies on quarterly results. And if this group fell off the table, and I thought the only reason they were on the table was because I was holding them like this, that we would pay the price. As you can probably guess, that group took off and has had three or four of the best quarters they've ever had. So Sheila and I separated over the summer of last year and the boys started going back and forth and we were getting used to our new life as a separated heading towards divorced couple. Another image for you. September 6, 2016, the start of the school year in Washington, D.C. Sheila thought that our middle son, Charlie, ought to look at another school last year. I fought it because I'm a trustee of a school in Washington called St. Albans. I went there, and two of our boys are there, and our third was supposed to be going there. And Sheila thought that Charlie ought to look at another school. I fought that. She convinced me he should. He went and looked at some other schools, fell in love with a school called the Field School, applied, got in. And as Charlie got in, our eldest son, Jack, who was doing fine at St. Albans, said, can I look at field two? Now my head really spun around. And I had had an image that on September 6, 2016, I and my three boys and Sheila were going to be sitting there in front of St. Albans. Great picture, full family, sort of back to the stock exchange picture. I was going to send it to all my St. Albans buddies saying, hey, look at me. Isn't this great? So now Char Sheila was out of the picture because we were separated. Charlie was out of the picture because he was going to field. And my eldest son, Jack, said, I want to go to field too. And after Jack went to see the field school, he came home that day, and we're walking to dinner, and Charlie's here. And I turn to Jack, I say, how'd you visit at field go? And before Jack could say anything, his younger brother, Charlie, goes, Dad, Jack thinks that if he tells you he likes field, you're going to get mad. And I looked at Jack and I said, the smile on your face tells me all I need to know. If you want to go to field, you can go to field. And what I realized was that that image was for me. It wasn't for them. And so on September 6th, Sheila and I took Wyatt to St. Albans and took a little selfie with me and Wyatt. And we put Jack and Charlie in the car and we drove them to field school. And took a picture with Jack and Charlie at the field school. And that image of all of us in front of St. Albans never happened. But that was a far healthier family image of everything that was going on at that time. So while I was doing all this work and while these anecdotes were happening, the relationship between Sheila and me as friends, as people separated heading towards divorce, started to change. But Sheila was still headed towards divorce because I had not let go. As much as I was doing my personal work, I had not fully let go of our relationship and let go of the expectations I had of her. And so we continued until November of this past year. And in November of this past year, I was getting packed for a trip at my house. Sheila said, can I come over? 
she came over and she said, I can see what you've done. I can see how you and I are communicating better than we ever have. I've seen how your relationship with the boys has fundamentally changed. And I was wondering whether you'd like to have an affair. <laughs> that wasn't a hard question to answer. And so, unbeknownst to anybody else in our lives, in November of last year, a couple that was still technically married started having an affair. And for November and December and January, the two of us got back together and found a new relationship that didn't have the ping pong match. It didn't have the anger and the frustration on my part. It didn't have the demeaning comments coming from me as it relates to why she wasn't living up to the expectations that I had for her. And in February of last year, almost a year to the day that we sat our boys down at our kitchen table to tell them that mom and dad were splitting, we sat them down at the kitchen table to tell them that mom and dad were dating. And about a month later, one of my buddies texted me and said, hey, I hear that you and Sheila are back together. That's great news. I said, it is. I'm really, really pleased. And it's wholly different and incredibly rewarding. And uh, my buddy wrote me back and he said, when did you guys start seeing each other? November? And I kind of shook my head and I said, nobody really knows that the two of us started having our little affair back in November. And clearly not my buddy Stefan. So I, I said to him, yeah, but how'd you know? And he wrote me back, look at your stock chart. <laughs> and I knew in my own head, but I'll tell you, if you go back and look at Walker Knopf's stock chart, in November of last year, it sort of goes vertical. And I'm not in any way saying that Walker Knopf's stock performance is directly correlated to my relationship. <laughs> but I thought that it was very interesting that my buddy sort of went back to the correlation between my own personal life and the business life. So on April 26th of this past year, Sheila's birthday, we flew to the Bahamas and we were on a walk on the beach and I got down on a knee and I'd taken her engagement ring from the first time we got engaged and I'd had it redone and I asked her if she'd marry me again. And thankfully she said yes. And as I look back on this experience, there are a couple things that I can't help but be thankful for and also recognize. The first is that we hit a very narrow window in our relationship for her to be able to influence my thinking, hand me that book, and for me to be able to do the personal work that I did. She tried previously, and I'd been a brick wall to it. I found every excuse in the world not to look in the mirror and own up to my problems. And so I realized how lucky we were, and it was quite honestly only because I was at rock bottom that I accepted that book and really read that book and really took to heart what it said. And that's extremely special, but I also know how lucky we were to hit that window. And it doesn't usually exist. The second thing is that from the very beginning of our separation, no matter how difficult things got, the two of us always respected one another. I have a friend of mine right now who's going through separation and going to divorce. And I called his wife, who was acting in what I believe to be a disrespectful way. And I said to her, just one thing to keep in mind is as you all go through this, whether you get back together or whether you stay apart, if you can treat each other with respect throughout, it will make everything so much better. And if either Sheila or I had lost that respect for one another in that process, we would have never gotten back to where we are. And the final thing is kids first. We always put our three boys first. Always. Excuse me. And that kids first approach made it so that whenever the personal thing would start to act up inside of either one of us, we thought what's in the best interest of the kids, and that helped push everything else aside. So the closing on the story is three weeks ago. Sheila and I were on a bike trip in southern France. Uh, she says she wants to jump into a little store to go do a little bit of shopping for the boys. I go get us some coffees. I sit down at a table, and about 10 minutes later, Sheila shows up, and she sits down, and she says, um, let me have your hand. 
and I put out my left hand and she bought this little plastic ring at a little store in this medieval French city and she slid it on my finger and she said, you want to get married? And so we're married again. <laughs> I am um, deeply thankful for the friends that helped me get through it, for the colleagues and their advice and counsel. And I am also extremely thankful that today the book, the book of our life, actually matches the cover, which is that picture. Thank you very much. Thank you.